Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well on this Lord's Day morning. It's my privilege to get to uh, teach the lesson this morning, and especially not just the Lord's Day, but a special day that we celebrate the Lord's uh, resurrection. Uh, before we start, let's just go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to jump right in because we have about uh, two and a half chapters to cover today. We won't even be able to read all of that scripture, but I'm going to try to cover most of it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day when we can celebrate your resurrection. Thank you that you gave your life for us, that you were, were, were raised again for our justification. And Lord, as we look this morning at this passage that gets right to the beginning of, of this important uh, Abrahamic covenant and the events surrounding, us, uh, surrounding it, that we will take uh, great comfort for our own lives and that we would rejoice and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week when um, Alex taught, uh, one of the things that we ended up with in, the, in chapter 15 of Genesis is um, God's covenant with Abraham and his promise to Abraham that even though he was old and he had never had children, that God was going to give him a son, and God told him to look at the stars of heaven and to... Um, and he used that to, to, to just say, Abram, your seed, your offspring are going to be just like that, innumerable. And um, we, we get now to uh, Genesis chapter 16. And when we arrive here, this is some 10 years after that uh, promise was made to Abraham. And... Um, you know, Abraham was a lot like us. Uh, you know, you get impatient and he's waiting. He was already old when the promise was made. And you start to think, wow, has God forgotten? Uh, and we get impatient. And uh, what we're going to see today, one, one of the overarching themes is, is just this, that God sometimes seems slow in fulfilling his promises. And this causes us oftentimes to want to run ahead of him, to implement our own plans, and that inevitably leads to trouble. And it, it ended up in some trouble here, we're going to see. Uh, in these chapters, Abraham feels threatened at times. He fears for his loved ones. He uh, gives in, in some cases, to things he shouldn't give in to as a leader, and in one case in particular. And then, um, you know, we're going to realize though that most believers, we go through experiences just like these at one time or another. Uh, but the truth is, even though it was 13 years later, God's program for Abram was right on schedule. Uh, and, and, but in, in Abram's infinite human thinking, neither he nor his wife Sarai could grasp that truth. And we're going to say, I should say Abram, because at this point his name had not been changed. And Sarah was Sarai. Because, because her name had not been changed. So he's 86 years old. He has no children. He has this promise from God, but it was 10 years later. And uh, God's promised to give him an offspring that was numberless like the star of, of heaven starts to seem a pretty long time ago. And I want to note a couple things about the events of this passage um, that we only have time to touch on. But first of all, it, honestly, it was a sort of a hard passage to prepare for, partly because these events occur in a culture that is that had customs that are are foreign and strange to us, and and we'll get there in a minute. But I'm just just going to note that and acknowledge it right off. And then, as is common in Scripture, um, it relates both the good and the bad behaviors of people that God has chosen as His servants and. I'm so glad that God doesn't present all of his servants as being flawless and only the good things because there is some encouragement to us that uh, e even when even when we fail, God still uses us. Even, even some of his greatest servants, we see some of the worst failures. Um, so let's go. I want to read uh, verse the first uh, 16 verses and then we'll comment on it. Uh, Genesis chapter 16 uh, in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the servant has prevented me from bearing children. I'm sorry, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Notice she takes it right back to the Lord. 
Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. He shouldn't have. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. So now she, it was her plan. Abram let her go through with it. Now she's blaming him. Verse six, but Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. So let's just stop there and, and uh, mention a few things. Uh, first of all, um, let, let's let's deal with this whole issue of polygamy, first of all. I mean, it's right there. We're going to talk about it. We don't have time in, in any way to cover it in such a short amount of time. But I just want to point out that in the patriarchal age, uh, there were polygamists. That was the culture of the day. And um, it was it was in the Old Testament life of Israel throughout uh, th throughout the Old Testament. That many were polygamists in, in some in the patriarchs and so forth. And uh but it's very clear, looking back on, on it with the knowledge that we have, particularly of the New Testament, that Jesus, Jesus said in particular, from the beginning, that was not so. God's plan was one man for one woman. So, you know, was polygamy a sin? Well, it certainly, uh, I'll, I'll quote Al Mohler on this. He said, well, it certainly fell short of the glory of God. It certainly was short of God's intention, as Jesus makes clear in Matthew 22, the, the pa passage I just cited. But it was allowed, even as later on the law, the, the, the law allowed divorce, but not because it was God's plan and purpose, but because Jesus says of the hardness of your heart. And we need to remember also, and this, this is as far as I'm going to go with this right now, but we, we have the concept of progressive revelation. And so uh, even the, in the beginning, that was the pattern that God set forth. But, but we don't really see God making condemnation of this in the patriarchs' lives. And, and, and so uh, was it against God's plan? Yes. Uh, did God honor these men? Yes. Is that God's will for us today? Absolutely not. It's very clear in the New Testament that that was not. We, we, have, we have a lot more. We have more revelation than they did at the time. So, but when we look at this, we just have to say that it's, that is something that God at least, uh, God at least, uh, uh, allowed. Uh, let's just say that he he allowed it, but not not condoned it. So he was what he was doing was would not have been considered wrong in the culture. They they he, he took the servant, she became his wife, and he bore a, a child by 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 that servant, and that was common practice. So let's just put ourselves in the situation of Sarai, though. Sarai does not have children, and barrenness, anytime you see that in the Old Testament, it's something that it carried, it carried more stigma than it would today. It was, it was something that a woman that would, would, that you just wouldn't, wouldn't want to be barren. And um, so, so we need to look at it through those eyes and sort of put ourselves in Sarah, Sarah's shoes a little bit. And then she, so she's going to feel the pressure of reproach from the culture for being childless. That's one kind of pressure that she had. And then she had the pressure uh, because of the way she thought about it. She had the pressure of God's promise to Abraham. And if you put, put her, yourself in her shoes, uh, she's thinking, wow, God's promise. And how is this going to ever be fulfilled? I'm old. I'm, I'm not, I can't even really humanly speaking, bear a child. So her plan was, understandable in a sense from a human perspective, but let's just be very clear about it. Her plan was sin. Uh, it's always a sin if we try to orchestrate the accomplishment of what God has promised to do himself. If God promises something will happen, we're not called to use artificial means 
to try to make it, to bring it about, and much less anything that's morally suspect to make it come about or theologically suspect. Uh, if we use those kinds of means, uh, it's, it's, it's sinful. And what Sarah proposes is, it, uh, was, um, was that she do just that. And uh, note that Sarah does makes, makes God the actor in her situation. She says, the Lord has prevented me from conceiving. Well, there is a sense in which that's so, so because if God willed it to happen when it did, yes, but, the, but, but it, it's almost as though she's putting blame on God. And, and, you know, things happen in God's time. God knows exactly what he wants to do. He's going to accomplish his purpose. And his time clock doesn't run on ours. And, um, you know, maybe right now in the middle of this crisis, uh, you felt sort of that way. Uh, I know as, as I'm sitting here talking, I am addressing people. Really, uh, D Dave Mincy pointed out last Wednesday night during our meeting that a lot of the folks that gave testimony there, and by the way, it was such a tremendous time. It was, it was really enjoyable to, to see people face to face. So I'd recommend that you join next time if you didn't get a chance. But, but Dave, Dave mentioned after hearing a bunch of testimonies, you know, um, there's really a, a big difference here. People are one extreme or the other. Either folks have basically nothing to do, they're out of work, and they're, they, have, they have stuff to they have things to do, but they're not the normal stuff. They have a lot of extra time on their hands to figure out how to be productive and fill that time. And then other people, Dave's in this situation, uh, Phyllis and I are also in this situation where, you know, we're, Phyllis actually had more work and my workload has continued and we're just working like we always did. And so uh, it, there's, there's issues with both of those situations and, and there's fear, uh, there's impatience. Well, you know, what is God doing here? And uh, uh, we certainly need to trust God in this situation because God, is, God has prepared to take care of us. So let's, let's, go, let's look at what happened here, though, as a result of what Sarah did. Let's start then in verse uh, 7, verse 7 of chapter 16. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the world. I'm sorry, I, 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 I um. Sarah, I, I should have started the, the sentence before that. Sarah dealt harshly with her, referring to Hagar, the servant, and she fled from her. So, the, so when it says her here, this is talking about Hagar. The angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Let's stop for just a second there and recognize that in this culture, for a woman to be out in the wilderness like that by herself, I mean, it would be true to some extent today, but especially back then, if you were going out into the wilderness as a woman expecting a child, you had no, no support, you were vulnerable, you were really putting yourself in danger. She's, she's really putting herself in a situation where she's very, very likely to, to, to die. So, so she was in a bad state. Um, and she said, Hagar says to the angel, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the, the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. She, this is literally what she called the Lord. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have been, I, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. What a wonderful statement. Therefore, the well was called Beer, 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 Beer Lahai, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it. I forgot to look that pronunciation up ahead of time. Beer Lahari, and I might not have said that right. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Now, let's think about the, these events that we've just read in the scripture. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want you, if you're not sympathetic to Hagar in this situation, I think you should be. 
uh, you, you've got to realize that she was Sarai's servant and she was in submission to her. And the Bible doesn't indicate, and it's unlikely in that culture, that Sarah would have had any say in marrying Abraham. We, we, I, we don't know whether that's something she wanted or not. It was, but, but at any rate, it was something that Sarai had told her to do. She was forced into this relationship as far as we can tell. I, I don't know. We don't know whether she wanted it or not. But, the, but the, the fact of the matter is, this was not really of her choosing. Sarai has lordship over Hagar, and she requires her to do this. And Hagar, but after the fact, Hagar was haughty about the fact that she had conceived and Sarai hadn't. So, you know, you can be... You, you can't be sympathetic to that, but you can imagine that if that was sort of something that was was a matter of pride, especially in that culture, and and uh, Hagar sort of flaunts it and is in her face, you can imagine what that would be like if, if you're Sarai and, and, and just feeling inadequate and all the things that would accompany that jealousy, all of these human and sinful things that well up in a situation like that. And that's exactly what happened here. And... Um, and then, as I mentioned, she's, she's outcast. She's going out into the wilderness. Um, and, you know, we should sympathize her because, again, because she was forced into the situation. And, um, you know, and, and, and we want to back up to and, and talk about Abram in this, too. Sarai goes to Abram and Abram was Abram was in charge of the household. He was the leader and he shirked. There's, I, I don't see any way around that. He really shirked his responsibility. He says, she's your servant. You, ha you have control over her. You do what you want. So, you know, I'll just stop there a minute. Anytime you're in a leadership position and somebody under you has a decision to make and they come and you just, it, it's a hard decision. You don't want anything to deal with it. So uh, to do with it, particularly if they're getting ready to make a wrong decision and you don't override that decision, uh, you're shirking your leadership responsibility. The buck does stop with you. You're responsible when you're asked for guidance to give good guidance. And Abram didn't do that. He, 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 he did not fulfill the right role as a husband there. Sarai was not right to send her out in the wilderness like that to make her vulnerable. That was not right in any from any human perspective, from any biblical perspective. She certainly wasn't loving her neighbor, uh, Hagar. Uh, and her servant Hagar in, in doing that. So Hagar has been wrong. She wasn't completely in the right, but she's very vulnerable here. And then the angel appears to her. Well, <laughs> as the, the word angel means sent, this angel was sent from God. And, you know, angels, they're not these cute little cherubic things that we see depicted. Anytime you see an angel appearing to a person in the Bible, unless they appear in the form of a man, which happens sometimes, but generally when, a, when an angel appears, there's fear. That's the first thing you say. They fell on their face or they were, they were afraid. And what's the first things out of, out of their mouth? Do not be afraid. So this angel appears to her. But when this angel starts talking, it's not a matter of fear other than just reverence and understanding uh, that you're in the presence of someone powerful. This angel speaks words of encouragement to her. And he says, she tells her, you need to go back and be, and be submissive to Sarai. Uh, she receives, but she receives a promise similar to the promise God made to Abraham. Uh, that she's going to have a son, that her seeds are, that, that, that her offspring are going to be many in number, all of these things. One of the things though that is in this message is her son is compared to a wild donkey. Now, a wild donkey in the wilderness at that time uh, was, uh, you know, it, it was said that if you took one of these wild donkeys that dwelt in the desert and you brought them into any kind of civilized place where there was stuff around it, they would just tear everything up. They were very destructive. So this was not a compliment to say that her son was going to be like that. He was going to be untamable. He was going to be sort of unmanageable. And, um, you know, and Ishmael is going to end up being the, the progenitor of tribes that are going to ultimately be, uh, be against Abram. And we could talk, I don't think we really have time to talk a lot about about the Ishmael and Israel and all of that, except it's not accurate to say that, that Ishmael is the father of, of Muslims. That's not really quite accurate, but it is accurate to say that, that, uh, 
that Ishmael is basically the father of the generations in that that part of the world, uh, the Arab part of the world that are not Semitic. So that 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 are not Jewish, and so. There is conflict there today, and it is true that most people who call, fall into that category, Islam dominates in that sense. But but it's not it's not Islam first; it's that area of the world and the and the and the um, and the um, uh, the people who dwell there. And there has been conflict throughout. And I do want to circle back around to that in just a second, and and just mention really briefly. Uh, the, I'll just say it now because I don't want to forget to say this. Um, in Galatians four, we have there's more. It's there, there's more involved. There's more than meets the eye in this whole thing with with uh, with um, Isaac and Ishmael, um, because in the book of Galatians, uh, it it uses the Apostle Paul uses uh, Ishmael and Isaac as representatives. And uh, the the uh, Ishmael represents the bond, the, the 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 offspring of the slave, and he compares it to uh, Israel being uh, under the law, being under the law versus being under grace, and he uses that as a metaphor. And this is no accident. The, the Lord knew the Lord knew this at the time. The Lord planned it this way because He knew that. <laughs> uh, many years later, after the birth of Christ, and after uh, and after. Abram's offspring produced uh, uh, Jesus Christ and he blessed all the nations of the world that he was going to use this and that and we sh I shouldn't leave there without also pointing out that that God's promise to Abraham then encompasses through through um, through Isaac then eventually encompasses the and and uh, blesses the offspring of Ishmael because the, the, the scripture said to Abram, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And we know that because Israel rejected the Lord, after Israel rejected the Lord, salvation was offered to the Gentiles and and uh, th those distinctions were, were wiped away. We don't have the racial distinctions. We don't have any of that. And, and, and God's plan of salvation and his grace was offered then, but he, but even in in Old Testament times, God always always offered His grace even to Gentiles who were willing to to come under and serve the God of the God of Israel. So God's grace is evident throughout this. But the character of this man Ishmael, uh, he 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 is he is a uh, he's a force to be reckoned with, and and Hagar says that. But let me tell you something: if you're out in the wilderness, you're Hagar, and you are. Uh, you're you're facing death and, and and you're worried about things, and all of a sudden an angel appears to you, and you realize that you, you know you when she says truly I have seen him who looks after me. What what an amazing and comforting thing. Um, Hagar is this lowly servant from Egypt. She's been harshly treated. She's helpless. But she's seen by the Lord, and she's given a promise, and prom and God gives her a son. Th that that was all of that was encouraging to her, and uh, we hear the description of, Is of Ishmael as a threat, but Hagar seems to have heard it as a promise, and she says she was seen by God. We just need to stop and think about that for a minute, but, and we need to consider this truth because it is absolutely true. There's no one so small and so insignificant that God does not know them intimately. And there's no one so small and insignificant that, uh, that they're not loved by God. There's no one who's not known to God. There's no one who's not loved by God. And um, so we, we can take great comfort in that. And it's such a tender expression of, of faith and, and, and gratitude to God right here from Hagar, this, this servant. Um, so that brings us now to chapter 17. And let me do a ch time check here. Let's see where we are. We're at 24 minutes, so we're going to have to go quickly. I'm, I'm not planning to spend a lot of time in Genesis 6, 17. Um, 
and, and I'm not going to be able to read through the whole passage, but I do want to read verses one through eight. Uh, and, and here again, we go to a new passage and a bunch of time has passed. Uh, the, it tells us in uh, verse uh, 24, I believe, or that, um, that Ishmael is 13 by this time. So you've got to keep in mind the time frame. And let me find my, let me find my scripture passage here and get to that. Genesis 17 and verse 1, um, 1 through 8. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may take my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of, uh, of a multitude of nations. Same, same thing that he said to him, I guess now 23 years prior to that. No longer, but now he does something different. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Listen to this, this phrase, for an everlasting covenant. That's very important. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. Listen to this again. The land of Canaan for what? An everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Everlasting means everlasting. It doesn't mean, uh, oh, th because they rejected Christ that these promises are null and void. I believe that I, I follow the dispensational view that 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 those promises that were made to the nation of Israel were made to the nation of Israel. And I, I believe Israel already is back in the land. There's a nation there today, but there's more promises still to come. And God's going to still, God's going to fulfill that covenant. That covenant has not been rescinded. And so I just wanted to point that out while we're here. And then I, I wanted to just very quickly, let's just listen. To, uh, let, let me list a few things that were right there. First of all, I want to note that uh, Abram's name, Abram means exalted father or the father of many. So all of his life, Abram's been known by this name that means exalted father or father of many. But for most of his life, he was childless and he was known by this name. Well, now, instead of the father of many, he changes his name to Abraham. And Abraham means the father of multitudes. <laughs> so God is just reiterating his promise, even through the name change of Abraham. And then let these these parts of this covenant, first, I will make you very fruitful. And then the result of that fruitfulness, you could almost th say that there, this is a, a, a making even more specific as fruitfulness. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. And we know from our, even our history in the Old Testament that all of that has come to pass. And I will bring, I will be God to you and your offspring. And the whole land of Canaan I will give you as an everlasting covenant. All of those are parts of it. And then, then I'll just notice, note really quickly, I've noted before, what's the length of the covenant? That covenant is everlasting. And what are the conditions of the covenant? I don't see any conditions. Do you see any conditions? Now, what he's going to get to next is there is some human responsibility, but that human responsibility is not in, in, in making the covenant come to pass. That human responsibility is in a sign that God's going to give. And we don't have time to go through all of those, all of the scripture about uh, circumcision. But let me just say this. Circumcision was a sign and Abraham was commanded to do it. Now, God with, with his covenant, sometimes there will be a sign. The covenant with Noah uh, the sign that was put there was a rainbow. That rainbow just appears. God did that, and there's not a human responsibility to make that, that happen. In this case, there was a human responsibility. Abraham was told, and the Jews were told from then afterward until New Testament times that the, the males uh, were, were to be circumcised, and that was going to be a physical sign on their body of, of this covenant. And um, we'll just stop with that because we're... we're uh, going to be running close on time and I don't want to uh, to run out. Um, 
And I, I will not get a chance to read the rest of that scripture passage, uh, but let's, um, let's skip down to, let me make sure I'm not missing anything I wanted to, absolutely wanted to cover. Oh, I'm sorry. I did want to mention one thing. Uh, verse, in verses 15 to 27, uh, where, when, when God says this to Abraham, uh, reiterates the promise, and he says that Sarah is going to bear him a son, Abram laughs. And, and there's two ways that you could laugh. You can, it can be a laugh of sort of cynicism or I'm not, I, I, oh yeah, I, believe, I, I don't believe that. And it's that kind of laugh. And then there's a laugh that's more of, um, uh, I will call it a laugh. It's just a laugh of mirth. You hear something and it's just so, so wild. It just makes you laugh. You laugh out of joy or you laugh out of, wow, who would have ever imagined that? And it's very clear that um, that Abraham's laugh here is a laugh of mirth. He's not mocking God. He's not saying, yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. It's a laugh of mirth. Um, and then we'll get, we'll, we'll get to Sarah's laugh in a minute because it's a little bit different. In fact, let's go there now. Uh, Genesis chapter 18. Let me switch over to that. Okay. Genesis 18 and verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and three men were standing in front of him. Now notice it said the Lord appeared to him, and then it said three men standing in front of him. And you're, you're gonna, we're going to realize that these, these are not just mere men. They are they're, they're angels. And, and the Lord. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And, at, and after that, you may pass on since you have come, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abram went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seas of flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abram ran to the herd and took, took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree until they ate, or while they ate. And I'll, I'm just going to point out there, Abram is, is offering hospitality. And it's, it seems very, very clear that, uh, that, that there's also a reference in, in Hebrews uh, that, that refers back to this passage. And I'll read it quickly because I've got it. It says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. And I didn't want to pass that by, especially in this, this time right now when so many of our neighbors, they're fearful. Some of them are in need. There are older people who maybe are they're vulnerable and they're in the house. Uh, we need to be especially uh, mindful of the state that people are in. Uh, I heard about one pastor in the area recently who said, uh, a friend of mine who lives in Raleigh said, their pastor had said, don't waste this pandemic. And what he meant by that is people's hearts are more tender. They're thinking more. They're, they're, feel, they're feeling vulnerable. They're more likely to be respe receptive to spiritual things, all of those things. And not only that, people are, people are in need. And so we need to be watching for people that we can help, people that we can show Christ's love to and use that as an opening and use hospitality. And we're told to do that. And so we need to make sure we, we don't neglect this time and not waste this pandemic during that time. And we can take an example from Abraham here. And um, so th th then we go to verse nine. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abram and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. In other words, she, humanly speaking, there was way she was way past childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? 
The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now, now that I am old? I'm sorry. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. Well, <laughs> I, I can't imagine I, I even, it, I, it's not humorous to lie to the Lord, but in some ways it's like, you know, if you're going to lie to somebody, you don't really want to lie to somebody who knows the truth. And, you know, God always knows the truth. So there's no point in ever trying to deceive God. But yet it's our human nature to do that. I mean, look at Adam and Eve, as soon as they sinned, they tried to hide from the Lord. They covered themselves with fig leaves. And we have all sorts of sophisticated ways of making fig leaves to ourselves, but we don't fool God. He knows the truth. He knows the truth about us. Um, and then one word of encouragement there. Even, the, even Sarah's response, even though she initially did not respond correctly, I, w I would like to point out to you that she eventually did. She did respond in faith. And she gets listed in the New Testament, and commended for her faith, just as Abraham gets commended for his faith. So sometimes we fail the Lord and we and we don't act in faith, but 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 we can come back to the Lord. We can get our heads right. We can recognize who we serve and we can recognize His power and His care for us, and and God will still reward that faith. God forgives us whenever we don't have faith. So. We probably should start to wrap up. I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to close out by just thinking about, um, um, uh, well, I'm, I, sh I should say that it's, it's obvious that Sarah's laugh is different from Abram's. She, her laugh really was a cynical laugh, and then she denies it. Um, but let's, let's just think about some of the principles that we, we can draw from this. Um, first of all, God doesn't need our help in fulfilling his promises. God didn't need Sarai's help. God didn't need Abram's help. He, she, she would have had a child regardless of whether she had stepped in. And um, if we think about that for ourselves, you know, we have known duties that God has asked us to fulfill. And many times they, they seem burdensome. Sometimes we get impatient because it doesn't seem like God is doing anything. Maybe you feel like you're not making progress. Maybe you feel like, wow, I was just on the verge of getting to a good spot in my life, and now the whole economy fell out from under me, and what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that, that everything's going to work out according to your definition of it's working out, because that's not true. God doesn't always work out everything the way we want things to work out. Uh, I could be bankrupt this time next year. You could be bankrupt. We might have members of our family who've passed away from the coronavirus. God does not promise to prevent us from every single calamity. What he does promise to do is he promises to take care of us and he promises that everything that he does is for our good. And I, I will just say to you, I, I can testify and I'm sure that you can testify that some of the times in my life when I was the most afraid, some of the times when I was the most vulnerable, some of the times when things didn't, in fact, most of the time when it was when things didn't work out the way I wanted them to. And I faced a trial where God allowed circumstances that I would never have chosen for my life. Those are the times that I grew the most. Those are the times that God taught me. And you know what? I wouldn't trade those times. And, uh, and, and you know, there's sometimes I look back and I, I, and I get in the wrong spirit and I think, oh, if only that wouldn't have happened, then this could have happened and that could have happened, woulda, coulda, shoulda. But at the end of the day, when we look back on it, God intended it for good. And, and all things, we know that all things, God works all things together for good. God's the actor in that verse. God works all things together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And God worked everything out according to his plan for Abram and Sarah. He didn't need their help. He'll do it for us. So don't try to control things. And um, we can do the, we can do the, our, 
do our, our known duties to the best of our abilities and trust God to fulfill his plan for us. And we shouldn't try to control things that God has left out of your responsibility of oversight and out of your control. Now, if he puts something under your oversight and it's your duty to watch it and to some, in some sense control it, you're supposed to fulfill your duties and you're supposed to take ownership uh, to use the Genesis term, you're supposed to take dominion over those things that are within your control. We're supposed to be responsible and do our duties. We're supposed to res resp be responsible and make decisions and lead those things that God has put under our stewardship. But when it's outside of your control and when it's, when it's something that you can't do anything about, don't try to control it. And we need to, that's when we need to say, do, do what the scripture tells us when it says, cast all our care upon him. Why? Because he cares for us. He cares for us. In everything, do your best. In all your duties, do your best and leave to God the rest. That's one principle. Another principle is that God sees and knows everything. He knows and loves each one of us individually and intimately. We've already said that. Every single one of us. Uh, do you know, you know, one of the things that we, we all crave is intimacy. We want somebody who not only loves us, but truly knows us and truly loves us. And in spite of what they know about us, they love us and they accept us anyway. We want to be fully known and fully loved. And there is no other person that can make that, that, that you can say, I am fully known and fully loved by them. Not even your spouse, not even your spouse fully knows you. But God does. So we can take comfort in that. And then God gives us reminders of what he has done within us and for us. He, he, he will give us reminders all the time if we're watchful for them. If we be still and know, as the scripture says, be still and know that I am God. Oh, what a wonderful time for many of us where God has forced us to be still. We had testimonies of that on Wednesday night and different people in different ways said, you know, I've had to slow down. I've spent more time in the word. We spent more time praying. We spent more time talking to the family, talking to the things of the Lord. I spent more time in prayer. Uh, what a wonderful time to be still and know that I'm God. What a wonderful time to know, know that he is God. And what a wonderful time to sit and reflect upon God's goodness to us to sit and reflect upon areas where maybe we've not been as submitted to God as we should, areas where we've forgotten, areas where we've been uh, neglectful in our duties and all of these things. What a wonderful time this is. Uh, don't waste this. Don't waste this time in your life to do good to others. Don't waste this time in your life to be reflective uh, uh, and, and think upon God and to think about your own soul and your own heart and be right with him. Um, and then God's not pleased when we're doubtful or cynical about his plans for our lives. When we act as though he's not fulfilling his promises or that he doesn't, does not care for us. You know, when bad things seem like they're happening, things that we wouldn't have chosen, it's always got Satan can tempt us and our flesh can tempt us in so many ways. One of the ways is uh, Satan can say, see there, God, God doesn't want what's best for you. Or so one of the ways he punishes us is, or, or, or that Satan deceives us is if we are right with God and we've, we've tried to be faithful to him and we're, we're not rebelling in him in any known, against him in any known way, Satan will still point his finger at us and say, you know that failure back there in the past? You know the reason this bad thing is happening to you? It's happening to you because God's punishing you for that thing way back there. That's a lie. If you're submitted to God, if you've confessed that to God, God doesn't, God doesn't beat his children uh, over something that they've already confessed and gotten right with him. His purpose for chastisement is restoration. And when that restoration is restored, sometimes he allows natural consequences of those things to follow us. They're a reminder, just as we do that with our own children. But God doesn't just punish us just to punish us. You know, punishment for those sins was taken care of on the cross. God's wrath was satisfied on the cross. If, if, if anything bad happens to you, he's either chastising you because you're not right with him. And if, if that's the case, you're going to know what it is. He's going to he's going to he's going to put that thing in front of you and you're going to know I'm not submitted to that. and I need to get it right with him. The other reason that he lets bad things happen to us and allows it to happen is 
He's just conforming us to his image. He's given us more faith. The trying of our faith worketh patience, as James says. He conforms us into his image, and those hard times mold us in ways that the easy times can, as we've said before. Let's take all of those things with you, and I've run, uh, I wanted to quit at 40 minutes, and I'm I'm about four or five minutes over, so we should stop right now, but let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that even a great person that you commend in Scripture, you said he was the friend of God. We see that he was not perfect. And when we look at these biblical characters, we don't look at them and, and, and say, oh, they're our heroes because they were so great. Yes, they you, you commend some great things about them, but at the end of the day, when we see the fact that they were sinful men too and sinful women too, what it really does if we look at it the right way is it just get, makes us even more thankful for your grace. Those The perfect, imperfect kings, the imperfect prophets, the imperfect priests that you present in the Old Testament, they just drive our hearts to long for someone who would be the perfect priest, someone who would be the perfect king, someone who would be the perfect prophet. And the Lord Jesus had all fulfilled all of those roles in one. He was the king that we long for, the prophet that we long for, the priest, the only priest that could make a, a sacrifice that was efficacious once for all for our sins, the sins of the whole world. The only, only sacrifice that could have absolved us, of, that, that could have propitiated your wrath. Thank you so much for your word. And thank you that even though we have that to know, which is the greatest thing that we could ever have for eternity. Our hope is not merely in eternity. Our hope and our joy and our comfort is here on this earth too because we have the privilege of walking with you. And when the world is, um, when the world seems to be faced with all sorts of uncertainty and fears and turmoil and strife, Lord, we can rest in you. Lord, you said, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest. Not rest, not physical rest. It's talking about there. It says, you shall find rest unto your souls. Thank you so much that we can have rest unto our souls if we know you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.